when you meditate during the Dharma talk. 99% of your attention should be with your breath. Let the talk be in the background. Because the Dharma is found inside the mind. The Dharma that's words is just pointers. And so as you listen to the talk, remind yourself okay, that they're pointing inside your mind. So if you're inside your mind paying attention to what you're doing, you're already at the right place. You don't need the talk. It's only when you find yourself wandering outside, you run up against the talk, and it points you back in. Because the real ignorance is not ignorance of words or principles, it's ignorance of what's going on in the mind. In particular, it's ignorance of seeing how you're causing yourself suffering. Altogether, it's ignorance of four noble truths. Ignorance where ignorance of where the suffering is right now, and of what you're doing to cause the suffering, and of what might you, you, you might be doing to put an end to the suffering, and actually seeing the suffering end. Those are the four things you could be paying attention to. Attention to, because there are things that are happening right inside. They're not happening in the words. The words simply point you. Okay, suffering. Your experience of suffering. Nobody else is experiencing it. It's as close as you get to a really pure experience. Because there's no way you can take it out and show it to us. And there's no way you can compare who's suffering more, exactly what it tastes like or what it feels like. But it is something you can know for yourself. So you have to pay attention to that. So when we talk about the Four Noble Truths, they're not some abstract teaching that dates from thousands of years ago peculiar to India. There are things that are happening right here, right now, and they're happening very directly in your awareness. So to chip away at that ignorance, you focus on the breath. In the Buddha's analysis of suffering, from ignorance comes fabrication, and bodily fabrication is the breath. If you breathe in ignorance, it can be a condition for suffering. If you breathe with knowledge and awareness, it can help cut through suffering. It helps you see your ignorance more clearly, and as you see your ignorance more clearly, that replaces it with knowledge. So when you're focused on the breath, learning to breathe comfortably, allowing the mind to relate in a comfortable way with the breath, you're taking your stand against ignorance and all the ignorant thought processes that go on through the day. You're putting up a resistance to them. You want to understand them. And it's through understanding them that you can go beyond them, and you can transcend them. And these principles are universal. That's why the Buddha called them noble truth. The word ariya also means standard. in the sense of universal standard. They apply to all of us. There are no exceptions. So it's something we all have in common. We each experience it for ourselves alone, but we have it in common. Suffering and the cause of suffering. Which is why the path to the end of suffering is something that's universal. It doesn't matter what country you come from, what your background, what your language. The path works across the board, if you apply it. If you realize this is something really universal, that applies to you as much as it does to everybody else. Most of us like to think of ourselves as exceptions to the rule. It's going to be different for us somehow. Especially when we hear about all the work that the various Ajahns put into the practice. 
we like to think, well, maybe we're better educated, maybe we know more in our culture. Well, no, we don't. The problems are just the same. They're dressed up a little bit differently in each case, but we all have the same problem. And John Fu, I once quoted a John Munn saying, people are all alike, but then they're really not. But then when you really get down to it, they really are. And John Fuang's comment on that was, take that and think about it for a while. There are some differences, but the, what we have in common is what's really important. It's like that chant we had just now, aging, illness, and death, separation. These are things we all have in common. And that chant is a little bit lacking in something, because in the original sutta, what it says, everybody should think about this every day, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're, whether you're lay or ordained. Remind yourself, I'm subject to, subject to aging, subject to illness, subject to death. Or as in the Thai translation, these things are normal for me. Subject to being separated from the things that I love. Life starts out and you're always learning new things, gaining new things, but then it reaches a point where they all start going away. What you do have left is your actions. You will, you will fall heir to what you do, you say, and you think, depending on whether, whether it's skillful or unskillful. And as the Buddha said, you think about these truths as they apply to yourself, that keeps you from doing unskillful things. You realize, oh my gosh, if I allow myself to think a lot of unskillful stuff today, the results are going to come. They're going to seep out into my words. They're going to seep out into my actions. They'll start not just thinking unskillful things, but doing and saying unskillful things, and it all begins to pile up. Do you want that? Say, so, well, no. So those thoughts are meant to keep you in line, to keep you from doing harmful things to yourself, harmful things to other people. But then the sutta goes on to say that you should remind yourself that these things don't just apply to you, they apply to everybody, no matter where you go. This lifetime, the next lifetime, whether it's whatever the realm. All beings that have been, all beings that will be, whether they're living, whether they're dying, whether they're being reborn, these principles all apply to them. And the Buddha says, as you, as you think about that, it not only prevents you from doing unskillful things, but it gets you on the path. You finally realize that there's no escape from these principles of suffering, its cause. And the path has to be the same for everybody, so that the cessation can be the same for everybody. You're not an exception. And no matter where you go, whether you could like to be reborn as a Brahma, or you'd like to come back maybe a little bit more wealthy, or maybe a lot more wealthy, better looking, more powerful, it all comes down to these same truths, no matter what. And that's meant to give a rise to a sense of sanguega. Not just restraint, but something goes deeper, a realization that the way you've been living your life really is going nowhere. The way most people live their lives goes nowhere. The only somewhere you can go is out. And even that's not a place, but still that's a direction. Otherwise life has no direction at all. It just kind of wanders around, looks at this for a while, looks at that for a while, kind of like a, the same map as if you're going to chart the way a dog wanders around the neighborhood. Sniffs at this, sniffs at that, goes wandering over here. Rolls in this, rolls in that. It really goes nowhere at all in particular. But if you make up your mind, okay, these truths are universal. The Buddha shows the universal way out. Because he doesn't teach just good or bad karma or skillful or unskillful karma. He says there are gradations of skillful karma. In particular, there's just plain old skillful karma that keeps you in the cycle. And then there's the karma that puts an end to karma. 
That's the path. The path that cuts through the ignorance, the path that cuts through the craving that causes suffering. So that's the way out. So it's up to us to decide whether we want out or whether we want to still want to dabble around, want to roll around in a few dead squirrels. Whether we've had enough. If you had enough, okay, the path is all laid out from right view on through right concentration. Which means you try to endow your right concentration here with all the factors of the path. Virtue, concentration, discernment, all these things come together. So as you focus with the breath, try to do it in a virtuous way. In other words, do it with restraint. Remind yourself you can't go wandering off, dabbling in this, dabbling in that. You've really got to be true to your the theme of your concentration. And then use discernment. In what ways of focusing on the breath make it uncomfortable, make the mind uncomfortable, make the breath uncomfortable? What ways of focusing, what ways of thinking about the breath? What ways of labeling and understanding the breath help make it more comfortable, easier to stay here so it does become your home? So no matter where you go, you do have this home inside. So you do have nourishment on the path. That's how your discernment works. So we're going to bring all of these qualities together. If you leave any of them out, then the path isn't complete, and when it's not complete, it can't do its work. So give it all of your mind. The word jitta in Pali means two things. On the one hand, it means just plain old mind. Secondly, it also means this quality of really being intent on what you're doing. And jitta as being intent, that's one of the elements of right effort, one of the bases for success. So give it your whole mind, your whole heart. So the results will be complete as well.